you would think that when we are dealing with those who consider themselves to be the heirs of the Enlightenment, when all the darkness of Christian times and the darkness of faith uh, were pushed aside and were inundated with the light of reason, we would think that these people, these men, would believe that the human mind is capable of knowing everything. Whereas in the medieval period, they were narrow and only considered God rather than all the things of science. Well, when we actually look at it, we see that in this post-Enlightenment period, and you're going to find Hawking and Richard Dawkins right in that period, they're from that whole school of thought, you're going to find that actually it is the case that for them, when you actually look at it, when you actually look at what they say, human knowledge, and we'll make, okay, how am I going to do this? Okay, so here's how you'd think, all right, the boundaries of knowledge, all right, it's so extensive, so complete, so incorporating everything. Well, actually, for the whole idea of this new enlightenment view of knowledge is that the boundaries of the human mind and what it can actually know are actually very limited. So here we go. Here we go, coming from both sides, knowledge. All right. Okay, here it goes. All these things are missed. All right, we can't know these things. Okay, knowledge, here we go. It goes, and then it's only going to be right here. Okay, it's only going to be right here. Me and my will. You laugh, and rightfully so, and we say, surely not, but the answer is actually surely. That all the things that man used to want to know about are excluded from this view of knowledge. Every, all the things that man wanted to know about in the past as, a, as important for his existence are excluded from the boundaries of knowledge. So things, as we see, and we, we will see, God, okay, and this is an important point. When these men exclude the possibility of knowing God, because that's what they're going to do. When they exclude the possibility of knowing God, they, what else is excluded from the realm of knowledge, from the grasp of knowledge? What other realities are excluded? The soul, well, we would expect that. We would expect that. But not just that, an objective universe, all right? These men who say they're, they're going to present to us the latest in scientific understanding of the universe 
actually are going to say that an objective view, an objective knowledge of the universe cannot be had. Okay? Objective knowledge. All right? And I'm going to ask you, I'll ask you as we go on, because the whole idea you would think is that we're trying to gain scientific knowledge when actually you'd think so. But, be, but if you look at the way that they exclude knowledge of God, they're also going to exclude knowledge of objective science. Objective science. Fully objective knowledge. And we're, we're here, too. We got this, too. Reality in itself. You would think that that's a big thing. You would think that that would be something, surely the end result of this whole endeavor. But reality in itself is going to be excluded. All right, so we exclude God by the same moves, by the same principles that we exclude the possibility of knowing God, because that's what they're going to do. You're going to exclude the possibility of knowing reality in itself. It's surprising, but that's what, that's what they do. So what are they left with? Surprise, surprise for our world. What are they, what are we left, what are they left with? Me and my will. No, oh, oh, no, no. I didn't want to say will. No, no, no. It's, no, it's even worse. No, that's way too ontological. Me and my choice. And you laugh. You laugh, me and my choice, okay? It's going to be, it, it, when, when, it's only, it's in chapter one of the grand, the grand design. It's actually going to be me and my universe, okay? Actually. So, look what sacrificed when you sacrifice God, the moral of the story is, when you sacrifice God as being unknowable, you also sacrifice a knowledge of all the things, we can put ethics in here, okay? You sacrifice all the things that make life worth living, that make human life valuable, all right? The human life, the grand reality that it actually is. And you reduce, you reduce life to being mere stardust, okay? That's what, you know, Stephen Hawking loves to throw in our face that uh, we are mere stardust, okay? And also, he's going to say, and it's shocking, okay? For example, Richard Dawkins, he's going to mock the idea. He's talking, of course, his purpose is political also, talking about the human embryo and saying, well, it's just a, a, you know, an aggregate of cells just put together, an aggregate of cells. In fact, no better an aggregate of cells, no more significant an aggregate of cells than you'd have when you had a, a, worm, de a worm developing or a fish or anything else. A chimpanzee. Nothing different. So it's shocking, but this is where they're going. This is the, this is the cost. 
Now, I want to keep moving down the road that Stephen Hawking laid out for us, okay? He said he's presenting the grand history of human knowledge, okay? Grand history of human knowledge. And so far, mankind really hasn't gotten anywhere. And we're already down to the time of Aristotle and the Stoics, okay? That's where, we're gonna, that's where he goes next. He speaks in his presentation of human knowledge and science of, next of Aristotle and the Stoics, okay? So we can say uh, 100... <laughs> Since the, I'm always working with this figure 200,000 years for man's history, okay? Where the Homo sapien has existed in the world. 200,000 years Homo sapien has existence, existed. But basically for 198,000 years, no real understanding of human, of, of reality, of the cosmos has taken place, Okay? So that's, that's what he's saying. So this is in itself, I think, shows you the limitation of and the absurdity of some of this thought. So here we have the Stoics. And also we'll put in Aristotle there, okay? Because that's what he does. Okay, so the Stoics and Aristotle. The ancient, ancients, the famous ancients. All right, so that's where he is next. And again, I want to read him. Let's read him. Page 23. The Stoics, a school of Greek philosophers that arose around the 3rd century B.C., did make a distinction between human statutes and natural laws, but they included rules of human conduct they considered universal. Veneration of God and obedience to parents, for example, in the category of natural laws. Conversely, they often described physical processes in legal terms, this confuses me a bit, okay, brothers, I, you got to think about this, because conversely, they often described physical processes in legal terms and believed them to be in need of enforcement, even though the objects required to obey the laws were inanimate. What? You, you know what he's talking about. You know what he's trying to talk about. All right? You know that he's talking about the natural law. All right? The Stoics, the Stoics had this concept that there was a law that uh, percolated through nature, that formed nature, that was expressed by nature, all right? And to some degree, it was man's requirement that he conform to that law, all right? So it was the beginning of an understanding of a natural law, okay? Beginning of some understanding of the natural law. Of course, he confuses, Hawking, Hawking confuses two things really. He confuses the movement of inanimate objects, okay, with the movement of human desire, okay? The, hu the movement of human desire does come under the natural law, okay? That does come under the natural law. But what is he talking about with regard to inanimate things? All right, he's not making a distinction 
between the two. He puts it all together. Because I don't think he mentally realizes the distinction between the two. The, the orientation of human nature, where we desire to know God, we're, we're in, we know that we should live in community, all right, at peace with each other, and that's just a movement of natural things. Okay, that's two different things, and he should have made a distinction. But I know what he's talking about, and we know what he's talking about. He's speaking of these two things, and Aristotle is, is similar to the Stoics. All right, he's talking about teleology. Okay, teleology. Excuse me. Teleology, the movement towards an end. Telos, of course, is the Greek word for end. Okay, but it doesn't mean end like secession, where things stop. That's not what he they mean by end. By telos, the Greek the Greeks mean a goal. All right. Goal-orientedness, all right? When we speak of teleology, we are speaking of the fact that all things seem to be oriented to an end. They're oriented towards a certain state of fulfillment, okay? They're all oriented to move, to act in a certain way for certain goals. The Stoics and Aristotle recognized that and said, this is a key to understanding the universe, all right, that all things are moving towards an end. All things, all right, they're moving towards a goal. Things are not stagnant realities, but rather are oriented towards a goal, are oriented towards fulfillment. All right, and we can, we can see that f uh, for, for ourselves, that all of our actions are oriented towards goals, and all of our actions are really oriented towards the greatest goal, to the greatest good. Okay? So they, these people see... The whole world filled with meaning. Okay? Why? Because even the pagan Stoics, all right, and even the pagan Aristotle saw that there was purpose built into every, every movement in the world. Everything in the world in some way expressed purpose, okay? Purpose. And this is something Stephen Hawking is going to want to get rid of, okay? This ancient achievement that all things are moving towards a specific end, in, uh, proximate ends and ultimate ends, and that movement indicates that they were made for a purpose, a specific purpose. Okay, so he sees that. What is he going to say about that? Okay, that all things, according to these great philosophers, are moving towards goals. They're goal-oriented. This is what he says. This tradition continued to influence the thinkers who succeeded the Greeks for many centuries thereafter. Okay? In the 13th century... I mean, he should have done more reading up on this. Well, I... In the 13th century, the early Christian philosopher... Thomas Aquinas, 
I put in my notes say, bracket, what about St. Augustine? Uh, you know, 900 years earlier. Um, the early Christian philosopher, Tom Aquinas, adopted this view. Okay, looks good. And used it to argue for the existence of God. Okay, well, you know, he's always trying to do something. He's a priest and all. They're, they're always uh, in conspiracy, right, to make us think God is everywhere. Okay, so he adopts this view, okay, this view, and used it to argue for the existence of God, writing. This is, this is his paraphrase of St. Thomas. I had to fill in a little bit because it's just nonsense. It just didn't sound... This is what it should say, I guess. It is clear that non-rational beings reach their end not by chance, but by intention. Therefore, there is, therefore, an intelligent personal being by whom everything in nature is ordered to its end. May I repeat this? Let me repeat that. I mean, this is from the fifth proof, obviously, for the existence of God. It is clear that non-rational beings reach their end not by chance, but by intention. There is therefore an intelligent personal being by whom everything in nature is ordered to its end. That's St. Thomas Aquinas, all right? All these non-rational things are moving towards an end. They all seem to have purpose, therefore. Pur purpose saturates all of reality. Uh, you know, the... the uh, the little, let me give me an animal. The little pig, okay, we got a pig now, okay, at home. And um, they really do just put their face in the mud, all right, and just put their face in the mud and sleep and, and uh, walk around and grunt and eat little things on the ground. Um, they really do that. So all of that is oriented why do they keep themselves in existence by doing that? Because God, in a rational creature, put that into their nature, all right, directed them towards these ends. Okay, so, well, it makes sense. The pig couldn't do it himself, right? Herself, in our case, um, could not do it. So, this teleological view of nature. Grasped by the Stoics, grasped by Aristotle, okay, grasped by St. Thomas Aquinas, is part and parcel of the attempt to understand nature. It's, it's grasping one aspect of nature. All right, this is what we would say, but he doesn't like this at all. Not acceptable form of knowledge. And the problem is, so many of the people, that, the men that he holds up as worthy of praise, say the same thing. All right? Um, for example, you know that Aristotle... Don't say, because don't fall into their trap. Don't say, okay, well, that's a little primitive, but of course, for Aristotle, there were intelligences moving the heavens. Okay, intelligences moving the heavens in perfect motion. Uh, for St. Thomas, St. Thomas is going to speak of the angels, all right, being involved in the cosmic movement in the cosmic order that there was their intelligence even embedded and uh, behind various natural realities well Johannes Kepler okay Kepler 
whoa, he should be, he's going to say all this is dumb, right? We have to start anew, throw that off, reject that. Well, guess what? He doesn't, okay? Uh, Johannes Kepler, and he lives, he dies in 1630, okay, 1630, He, he, he's focusing on the orbits of the planets. He believed that the planets had sense perception and consciously followed, consciously followed laws of m movement that were grasped by their minds. Okay? Okay, consciously followed laws of movement that were grasped by their minds. This is not good, okay? Because Kepler's supposed to be one of the enlightened ones. And yet, look at this. He discovered the actual orbits of the planets. Okay. What, what Hawking doesn't like about these thinkers and this view of reality this teleological view of reality that says everything is goal-oriented and that, therefore, everything has a purpose built into it. He doesn't like this, all right? Even though it seems like practically the universal human tradition of understanding, he doesn't like it. Okay, and he just gives a little, I don't know, like a little in the eyes to Aristotle. I mean, no respect at all for Aristotle, really. And he says this about Aristotle. He says, well, Aristotle was focused on why nature behaves as it does. Okay, he was focused on the why. Why does nature act as it does? Okay. He wasn't focused on how it behaves. He's interested in the why. Because we, but that can't be asked. We can't ask that question. Why? Because I say so. I say so in my book. So this is what he says about Aristotle. This is the essence, this stuff, this is the essence of Aristotelian science. And even though it had little predictive value, yeah. all right, write that down. Uh, poor Aristotle, all right, his science has little predictive value meaning no value at all for, for um, Hawking, okay? It dominated Western thought for 2,000 years, okay? It dominated Western thought for 2,000 years. And I have in the brackets here in my notes, 2,000 years down the drain, I guess. All right, 2,000 years of more human thought down the drain, okay? So what are, we're, where are we now? We're getting pretty close to, I mean, basically, he's going to say, okay, he's going to put us to 1600 A.D., okay, 1600 A.D. From here, oh, let's just say this, from here to... Oh, Basically zero, basically zero accomplishment with regard to uh, human minds achieving knowledge of reality. That's what he ends up saying. He doesn't give it any kind of credence whatsoever. Zero attainment of reality. All right? So we're, we're way down here. Okay. And this is how he... Now, okay, so what were these men trying to do? What, like, what were the Christian thinkers 
trying to say with their theories, their views of their philosophy, their natural science, their natural uh, attempt to understand the laws of nature. What were they trying to do? This is what he says. He says, the Greeks' Christian successors rejected the idea, okay? So anytime we say, anytime he says Christian successors or Christian anything, it's not going to be good, all right? He's going to be viewing it in an extremely negative way, okay? So this, he's really holding as bad and as a waste of time. So what is number one? Christians, Greeks, Christian successors rejected the idea that number one, the universe is, in, is governed by indifferent natural laws. Okay, number one, the, the Christian thinkers rejected the idea that the universe is governed by indifferent natural laws. Natural laws that don't care about you and me. A, a system that doesn't care about you and me or purpose. Number two, these Christian thinkers also rejected the idea that humans do not hold a privileged place within the universe. Okay? These thinkers rejected the idea that humans do not hold a privileged place within the universe. So Hawking is saying, wants to emphasize, and that's going to be at the end of the road in this tracing out of the history of knowledge, humans don't matter. We're just stardust, literally on a far, far planet in the Milky Way, which is tiny, with a tiny sun, everything tiny, and then you all, tiny, on the tiny planet, around the tiny sun, meaningless. Um, yes, <laughs> okay, so just everyone feel meaningless right now <laughs> and say... Thank you, Mr. Hawking, for all your, <laughs> for publishing your book, and uh, <laughs> you've really <laughs> brightened my day. Um, <laughs> should, should we take one question, perhaps? Yes. Okay, one question, and then I think I'm done for here. Yes, go ahead. Brother? So if we're meaningless, Christian thinkers are meaningless. Then who, Christian thinkers are talking nonsense. Then who thinks practically? Who thinks practically? You're looking right at him. No, he's in the back. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> All right. That's why you buy the book. You want to find, okay, that's why he thinks you're going to buy the book because then you can find out what, where things stand in human knowledge, right? You can find out what M theory is. That's, that's really his theory, M theory. Okay. He's going to have M theory. And you can base your life on that, M theory. I'm at the end of this whole thing. I want to... I've been thinking about it. I have a, I have a one theory <laughs> that, I, that I want to pass by you since you're, you're thinkers. Uh, one theory, and it's, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, M theory is his theory, and that's, that's where he's going. Okay? But remember, all these millennia and millennia and millennia of human history no concrete, true understanding of, of, of reality. Does it seem plausible? I think it, no. 
well, how are we going to, after all this, how do we get to M theory? How do we get to his theory? Surely there's got to be some turnoff somewhere. Because we're obviously heading in the wrong direction with all these thinkers down through 198,000 years, right? We're all, no, more than that, but 98,600 years. Um, we're, all, we're off this road, right? So how are we going to turn subtly? How is mankind going to turn subtly onto the road that Stephen Hawking thinks we should be on? And uh, that's the next one. Okay.